Hey folks, um, Myers Mega Fictional Musings, thanks for tuning in. I want to talk about Milan Kundera today, and I'd like to actually read a little bit to everyone. Um, he is uh, an absolute favorite author, and it's, it's a little bit difficult to pinpoint why perhaps, but um, he writes with a, just a unique tenderness and just trying to think how to articulate this best but um the prose is like restrained but profound and he's he's still very effectively able to tie narrative threads together while exploring these ideas that are just so resonant um so i'd like to read a little bit from this uh, pretty highly regarded book of his uh, the book of laughter and forgetting what a great title so this is this is currently my Third Kundera, I'm reading it with a, a couple of other awesome people online. Um, I've also read Unbearable Lightness of Being. I've done a video of that in the past, but uh, as well as another one called Identity, which is also very good. And I think I've almost got all of his now. I know he does have some nonfiction, uh, The Art of the Novel, which I can't wait to get to. I've heard great things. Um, so yeah, he, he's a very favorite author who I am very much enjoying exploring. Um, so a little bit of context here, okay? Now, this book has seven distinct sections um, with five or six chapters in each section, all, you know, spaced out pretty evenly. You know, each chapter is at two to three pages at the most. And they absolutely read like, you know, short stories, I guess, or, you know, segment, segmented or essays. But as I said, he's, there's still a, a narrative thread that ties it all together. Um, but I just wanted to read this beautiful um, chapter here. So again, a little bit of context. So uh, um, I'm just going to go back, and, and this is the start of the chapter, start of the section, I should say. So this is chapter one of this section called Angels, all right? Rhinoceros is a play by Eugene Ionesco, I'm not sure if I said that right, during which people obsessed by a desire to be identical to one another gradually turn into rhinoceroses. Gabriel and Michelle, two American girls, were doing an analysis of the play as part of a summer school course for foreigners in a small town on the Riviera. They were the pets of Madame Raphael, their teacher, because they always kept their eyes on her and carefully wrote down her every word. She had given the two of them a special assignment today, an oral report on the play for the next class meeting. So that's the start of chapter one. I'm just going to skip ahead now and read you this section where they re revisit these these characters. So good. Hope I do it justice. A weekly news magazine once ran a picture of a row of uniformed men shouldering guns and sporting helmets with plexiglass visors. They ate looking in the direction of a group of young people wearing t-shirts and jeans and holding hands and dancing in a circle before their eyes. It is obviously the period immediately preceding a clash with the police who are guarding a nuclear power plant, a military training camp, the headquarters of a political party, or the windows of an embassy. The young people have taken advantage of this dead time to make a circle and take two steps in place, one step forward, lift first one leg and then the other, all to a simple folk melody. I think I understand them. They feel that the circle they describe on the ground is a magic circle bonding them into a ring. Their hearts are overflowing with an intense feeling of innocence. They are not united by a march like soldiers or fascist commandos. They are united by a dance like children. And they can't wait to spit their innocence in the cops' faces. That is the way the photographer saw them too. And he highlighted his view with eloquent contrasts. On the one side, the police in the false imposed and decreed unity of their ranks. On the other side, the young people in the real, sincere and organic, unity of their circle. On the one side, the police in the gloom of their ambush. On the other side, the young people in the joy of their play. Circle dancing is magic. It speaks to us through the millennia from the depths of human memory. Madame Raphael had cut the picture out of the magazine and would stare at it and dream. She, too, longed to dance in a ring. All her life, she had looked for a group of people she could hold hands with and dance with in a ring. First, she looked for them in the Methodist church. 
her father was a religious fanatic, then in the Communist Party, then among the Trotskyites, then in the anti-abortion movement, a child has a right to life, then in the pro-abortion movement, a woman has a right to her body. She looked for them among the Marxists, the psychoanalysts, and the structuralists. She looked for them in Lenin, Zen Buddhism, Mao Zedong, yogis, yogis? the Nouveau Roman, Brechtian theater, the theater of panic. And finally, she hoped she could at least become one with her students, which meant she always forced them to think and say exactly what she thought and said. And together they formed a single body and a single soul, a single ring and a single dance. Her two American students were in their dormitory room poring over the text of Ionesco's Rhinoceros. Michelle was reading aloud. So this is the logician to the old man. Take a sheet of paper and do the following problem. If we take two paws from two cats, how many paws does each cat have left? The old man to the logician. Well, there are several possible solutions. One, can, one cat may have four paws, the other two. There may be one cat with five paws and another with one. If we take two paws away from eight, we may have one cat with six paws and one without any paws at all. I don't see how anybody could cut off a cat's paws, said Michelle, interrupting her own reading. Do you think he could? Michelle, Gabriel said loudly. And how could one cat have six paws? Michelle, Gabriel said again. What? asked Mich Michelle. Have you forgotten so soon? You're the one who said it. What? asked Michelle again. The dialogue is meant to create a comic effect. Oh, that's right, said Michelle, giving Gabriel a happy look. The two girls locked into each other's eyes, then the corners of their mouths began twitching with pride, and finally they let out a short, breathy sound in the upper reaches of their vocal registers, and then one another, one of the sounds and still another. Forced laughs, laughable laughs, laughs so laughable they made them laugh. Then it came, real laughter, total laughter, sweeping, sweeping them off in its unbounded effusion. Bursts of laughter, laughter rehashed, jostled laughter, laughter defleshed, magnificent laughter, sumptuous and wild. And they laughed to the infinity of the laughter of their laughs. Oh, laughter! Laughter of delight, delight of laughter. Meanwhile, Madame Raphael roamed the streets of that little town on the Riviera, utterly alone. Suddenly, she raised her head as if sensing a sliver of melody on the wings of a breeze, a fragrance from far-off lands. She stopped, and in the depths of her soul heard the rebellious scream of a void yearning to be filled. She felt that somewhere nearby a flame of great laughter was flickering, and perhaps somewhere not far off a group of people was holding hands and dancing in a ring. She stood there for a while, looking around nervously. Then the secret music suddenly disappeared. Michelle and Gabriel had suddenly stopped laughing. All at once their faces fell at the thought of an empty night without love. And Madame Raphael, strangely restless and on edge, made her way home through the warm streets of the small town on the Riviera. And that's the end of the chapter. Thank you so much for listening. Um, drop a comment if you like. Milan Kundera is in truly incredible. I'm just basking in, in the, his work here. Um, take care of yourself. Bye for now.